very grateful to Judy and the other administrators at the Radcliffe Institute for their benevolent guidance throughout the year, to my fellow fellows for their inspiration and the stimulus that they provide, to my research partners for their youthful energy and enthusiasm. And I just want to say it's been a fantastic experience doing human rights at Harvard. I think there's probably no better place to investigate human rights. And it's been wonderful interacting with some people that I regard as my heroes in this subject. It's invidious to name individuals, but I'll just go right ahead and do that. <laughs> um, the great Amartya Sen, um, John Ruggie, um, Charles Freed, Jerry Newman, and of course, Catherine Sinking, who's my fellow also uh, at the Radcliffe Institute been people whose work I've long admired, and it's been a tremendous privilege to be able to interact with them and discuss with them um, on the topic of human rights. So the talk I'm going to give today um, actually has a slightly modified title from the one advertised, it's Human Rights, Three Questions, and I hope we will actually get to the third question. Um, so let's begin. One of my favorite remarks about philosophy comes from Ludwig Wittgenstein. Wittgenstein said, it's difficult to begin at the beginning and not to try to go further back. Where should we begin when it comes to the philosophical reflection on human rights? The place to begin, I think, is not philosophy itself, but what, what, what we might call the practice of human rights, the role that the idea of human rights plays in the lives of ordinary human beings and in the cultures and institutions that they sustain. Now, some of this practice is crystallized in authoritative documents, such as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and the many legally binding <coughs> treaties that have followed in its wake. Some of the practice concerns the activities of institutional structures, among them states, international organizations, and the proliferation of NGOs, non-governmental organizations. But the important thing to stress is that the practice has a life beyond formal documents, beyond laws and institutions. It has a foothold in a deeper, culturally embedded self-understanding, one that ordinary individuals can draw on in order to formulate their aspirations and to give point to their criticisms of injustice and oppression. So my book begins by reflecting on this practice of human rights, not from some ethereal philosophical space. Citing Wittgenstein, I said the problem is to avoid going further back what would it mean to go further back? Well, one way to begin too far back is to begin from a philosophical theory of ethics. And by a theory of ethics, I mean an attempt to systematize ethics, ideally by reducing it to a single master principle. I think theory is the wrong place to begin for two reasons. The first is there's no reason to suppose that starting from there, human rights as we normally understand them will ever come into view we will change the subject or distort the subject. And it's not obvious why someone not already committed to the theory should be interested in unengaged or distorted reflections of this sort. Now, of course, the proponents of theory have a quick answer to this objection. They say that their theory embodies the truth about ethics. Therefore, to the extent that ordinary human rights thinking is sound, it must be congruent with the theory. But the problem is that it's very doubtful that any existing theory captures the truth about ethics. And that's not because there is no such thing as ethical truth, but because that truth is arguably not amenable to systematization. It does not flow from a single fundamental principle. Instead, it requires us to take into account a plurality of quite distinct values and to exercise judgment in discerning their practical implications. As the British moral philosopher Bernard Williams disarmingly put it, perhaps we need as many concepts to describe the ethical truth as we find we need, and no fewer. I would go further. Not only do we need multiple value concepts, we also need multiple methods for exploring and deploying those concepts. Philosophy, with its stress on abstract and discursive reasoning, is just one method. But there are many other methods for example, forms of literary fiction that bring out the significance of ideas such as the dignity of the individual through the emotionally resonant description of particulars. 
even if I wouldn't go so far as Lynn Hunt, the intellectual historian who has argued that the novel was the key to the invention of human rights in the 18th century. But that's partly because I doubt the coherence of saying that human rights were invented. Finding a more perspicuous way of talking about something is not the same thing as inventing it. So philosophy is one way of trying to make sense of the practice of human rights, to understand it, to evaluate it. But its authority doesn't come from mobilizing a pre-existing theory. So insofar as it has any claim to our attention, it comes from the fact that philosophers have been given the leisure to address this topic in a more sustained way than many others. As Judy pointed out, some of us are paid to do so. And from the virtues of clarity and rigorous argument that philosophers are supposed to cultivate, but which, of course, are not unique to philosophy. So the three questions that I want to discuss today are certainly questions for a philosophy of human rights. But they are not exclusively philosophical questions. They are questions for anyone who takes the practice of human rights seriously. And there are many different routes to getting at the truth about these questions. I'm particularly resistant to calling them philosophical questions, because all too often, in my experience, this is a rhetorical ploy for marginalizing questions we urgently need to deal with, marginalizing them by associating those questions with the activities of typically small and marginal university departments. Now, the book that I'm engaged in writing is, in some sense, outlandish in its scope and ambition. It tries to address some of the most fundamental questions in the philosophy of human rights, the morality of human rights, all the way to quite deep and complicated questions in the international law of human rights, so deep and complicated that they're below the pay grade of most international lawyers, at least practicing international lawyers. So you might think that any book that attempts within its covers to cover all of that material is a kind of fool's errand. But it's April Fool's Day. So I think, <laughs> I think what, what, better, what better day to try to talk about this quixotic endeavor of mine. So let me briefly introduce these three questions. And then I'll look into the three of them in greater detail and give you the shape of the answer that I'm groping towards in my book. So first, the first question is the question of the nature of human rights. What are we talking about when we refer to human rights? What distinguishes the set of standards for governing, this set of standards for governing human conduct from other standards we might recognize? For example, standards of justice or fairness, efficiency or plain old obligations. Now, maybe different people mean different things by human rights. That's probably true. But it still makes sense to ask whether there is a core concept of a human right, one that is central to understanding the practice of human rights. Other concepts would be parasitic or peripheral in relation to this core concept. So what's the nature of human rights? First question. The second question, what is the ground of human rights? Even if we agree on what human rights are supposed to be, how can we determine whether there are any human rights. Consider an analogy. We might agree on what we mean when we refer to unicorns or witches, but it's a further question whether any exist. Now, at least one prominent philosopher, Alistair MacIntyre, before he recanted, but anyway, claimed that human rights are like witches and unicorns, purely fictional entities, since no good reason has ever been given for believing in their existence. Can this skepticism be countered by offering grounds for affirming the existence of human rights? That's the question of grounds. Third question, a bit more nebulous, a bit less shape to it, but I call it the question of the force, the force of human rights in practical deliberation. Now, this is a many-sided question, but one way of bringing out what I'm concerned with here is in terms of the idea of conflict, human rights entering into conflict. It's often said that human rights conflict among each other. One person's right to privacy can conflict with another person's right to security. More commonly, it's said that human rights often conflict with the public good or with general welfare. So for example, it said, we respect 
the rights to due process of criminal suspects, even if we know that by violating those rights, we could better secure the general good. Should we think of human rights as systematically entering into conflicts with each other and with the common good? I think that's a profound error. I'll come back to this question of the force of human rights later. So let's begin then with the first question. What are we talking about when we talk about human rights? What is the nature of human rights? Now, the idea of human rights has come into the prominence since the Second World War, but they remain a focus or a locus of disagreement. Some people are skeptical that there are any human rights. Others disagree about which rights exist. Some believe that civil and political rights, such as the right to a fair trial or not to be tortured, are genuine human rights, but that socioeconomic rights, such as the right to work or to health or to an adequate standard of living, are not genuine human rights. But if we truly disagree in these ways, we must at least agree on what we mean by human rights. Otherwise, these would be merely verbal disagreements. We'd be like people disagreeing about banks, where one has in mind financial institution and the other the sloping bits of land on the sides of rivers. So even those who disagree about human rights must share a concept of a human right that makes that disagreement possible. But what is that concept? Now, in my book, I elaborate on and defend what I call the orthodox view of human rights. Now, that's a view that up until now has been widely subscribed to, if only as a slogan, rather than a properly worked out position. And the orthodox view can be formulated in this familiar way. Human rights are moral rights possessed by all human beings simply in virtue of their humanity. Right? Human rights are moral rights possessed by all human beings simply in virtue of their humanity. In other words, for short, human rights are universal moral rights. So let's break down this idea into two parts. On the one hand, moral rights, and on the other hand, possessed by all humans simply in virtue of their humanity. Human rights, according to me, and this orthodox view, are moral rights in the sense that they are rights that exist as a matter of what is morally true, justified, correct. Now, the crucial point I want to stress is to say that someone has a right is to say that they have an entitlement that places a duty on others. If I have a right not to be tortured, it's not just the case that others have a reason not to torture me, that it would be good if I wasn't tortured or somehow beneficial if I wasn't tortured. Instead, it's to say something further, that others have a moral duty or an obligation not to torture me. And one implication of this is that if they fail to act on that duty, they should feel guilty, rightly. They may properly be blamed by others. The victim may properly feel resentment. And in some cases, there may be consequent obligations to compensate the victim or to inflict punishment on the rights violator. So human rights are not merely a shopping list of goods that it would be desirable to secure to people. Instead, they have a graver import. They impose duties on us which render us morally blameworthy if we violate them. That is the powerful, critical edge that human rights introduce. Now, there may be moral rights of different sorts. Some moral rights I possess because of something I've done. For example, the right I have to a cup of coffee every morning after handing over money to verdicts. Other moral rights I have because I'm a member of a family or some other community. But some moral rights I possess simply as a human being, irrespective of what I've done or what other status I may possess, such as a friend or a teacher or a member of a particular political community. These universal moral rights are human rights. And the further point to make is that I possess these rights irrespective of whether others, including the law, social convention, public opinion, regards me as possessing them. I possess a human right because there is a compelling moral case for attributing it to all human beings, not because it's conferred by some act of social fiat. So human rights are not to be identified in the first instance with human rights law. On the contrary, it's the other way around. The defining point of human rights law is to give content and force to the independent morality of human rights. That's what makes human rights law, gives it its integrity as an area of law. 
Now, if we understand human rights in this orthodox way, then they are strongly continuous with what in former times were known as natural rights. We should, we should then see the contemporary human rights culture as essentially about the same topic as the natural rights tradition in the 17th and 18th centuries. In fact, as the great medieval historian Brian Tierney has argued, we could push this even further back to the emergence of natural rights in the writings of the canon lawyers of Bologna in the 12th century. Personally, I think you could push even further back um, to ancient Greece. Now, in recent years, thanks in large part to the influence of the great Harvard philosopher John Rawls, the orthodox view of human rights has come under severe attack. The orthodox view, according to Rawls, overlooks the fact that human rights are best understood as having a political function. This prevents the orthodox account from making sense of the practice of human rights. Now, philosophers who hold this political view differ about what exactly the political function that defines human rights is, or sometimes a combination of functions. Here I want to focus on one widely cited function, and it has two dimensions. So the first dimension is that human rights are political insofar as they directly impose obligations on the state or state-like entities, rather than on individuals or private groups within the state. So they directly bind the state or state-like entities, not individuals, not private groups. Second, human rights are political insofar as the failure of the state to comply with them is in principle, in principle, a trigger for international action. So according to Rawls, who has the most stringent version of this view, what's distinctive about human rights is that they are those rights which are triggers for military intervention. Right? So therefore, he actually comes up with a very, very short list of human rights, because he quite reasonably thinks that only a very short list of rights could justify military intervention. Now, only half-jokingly, I call this the Coercive Intervention Account of Human Rights, or CIA for short. <laughs> it indicates or it does have a wider relevant resonance. Other philosophers who adopt the political view conceive of intervention more broadly. They wouldn't make military intervention such an important criteria. They would also say things like economic sanctions or even formal rebukes by one state by another would count as a kind of international action or intervention. Now, the allure of a political conception of human rights is not confined to philosophers. The Harvard legal historian Samuel Moyne has argued that human rights were really born in the 1970s, thanks to the Carter administration. They are not essentially natural rights, and that's because only in the 70s, only in the 70s were human rights viewed as triggers for an international response in the event of their violation. <coughs> now, as a proponent of the orthodox view, I don't deny the obvious truth that human rights have political functions, but I do deny that their nature is given by any such function. Now, here's a comparison that hopefully makes that distinction clearer. There's no doubt that nuclear energy has political functions, but you can adequately grasp what nuclear energy is without knowing anything about the political uses, such as being part of a strategy of mutually assured destruction to which nuclear energy can be put. I think the same is true of human rights. You can grasp what they are by knowing that they're universal moral rights without knowing anything about the state or about intervention or economic sanction, sanctions or anything else. These things are relevant to how you might implement human rights, but they don't define their essential nature. So why do I reject this political view that's getting an enormous amount of traction? Well, let's go back to its two elements. First, I want to resist the claim that the primary or exclusive bearer of human rights duties is the state. I think it makes better sense of human rights practice to say that non-state entities can bear human rights obligations. So here are two examples. The first is the example of a solitary torturer. The solitary torturer randomly abducts passers-by and tortures them in his basement. If we know that this is what he's doing, I think we can immediately proceed to the conclusion 
that he is violating their human rights. We don't need to ask, is this man an official of the state? Is he operating with the connivance of the state or able to do what he's doing only because the state is not adequately meeting its own human rights obligations to eradicate torture? And there was a particularly poignant experience I had once listening to a talk by the UN Special Rapporteur on torture. He's in, responsible for um, overseeing the implementation of the Convention Against Torture, which is limited to states. And it's limited to states because it's a treaty. And it's treaties bind states that enter into them. And yet, he said, in his activities, he was ineluctably involved in non-state torture. Right? And there you see the contrast between the legal situation, which is it's about states, but the underlying moral situation <coughs> is not limited to states because the underlying moral right is one that binds non-state entities as well. So it was interesting to see him being sort of conflicted about this, but the conflict arose precisely from the tension between his legal responsibilities and the moral concern that those legal responsibilities were meant to reflect. There is a broader feminist point here as well to bear in mind, the attempt to limit human rights to the domain of high politics or the behavior of the state, um, I think goes against the idea that often in securing political values, we have to look at what happens in private realms. And here I would um, even um, quote the words of Eleanor Roosevelt, who was one of the framers of the Universal Declaration. She says, or she said, something to the effect that human rights begin in small places close to home. I think they actually can begin right in the home, not just close to home. The second example I want to give is the 2011 UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, which were principally authored by Harvard's John Ruggie. Now, these principles have been endorsed by the UN, the OECD, the EU, and a variety of other bodies, including the American Bar Association. And what is crucial for our purposes is that they directly impose human rights obligations on corporations quite independently of anything that the state is doing. The guiding principles are one of the most important innovations in human rights practice, and they break decisively with the statist assumptions of the political view that the primary or exclusive bearer of human rights responsibilities is the state. Moreover, and this is really crucial, Ruggie correctly emphasizes that corporations do not have human rights obligations because they're exercising governance functions akin to the state. And that's the last thing that we would want, I think, is to have corporations going around behaving as though they had the authority of a state. States have a duty to promote human rights, which includes to do that by enacting laws that bind other entities, like individuals and corporations. But corporations, under the guiding principles, have a duty to respect human rights themselves. Now, as a philosopher, it's gratifying to me to see Ruggi in his important book on the guiding principles pay tribute to Amartya Sen, one of the leading proponents of the orthodox view of human rights. What this illustrates to me is that far from being alienated from the contemporary practice of human rights, the orthodox view is actually at the heart of some of the most important developments in the field today. So let me briefly turn to the second component of the political view, Remember, the second component was what happens when the state fails to meet its human rights obligations? Answer, in principle, these violations are a trigger for an international response. Now, the most sophisticated deployment of this view is to be found in a very careful book called The Idea of Human Rights, written by the Princeton political theorist Charles Bites. Bites argues that human rights differ from other rights in that their violation triggers international concern. But then, as a mark of his intellectual courage, he faces up to the potentially alarming implications of this view. Now consider, as one example, rights against gender discrimination. This is one of these crazy philosophical thought experiments, so I'm giving you the warning now. Uh, suppose overwhelming empirical evidence was discovered that there was simply nothing outside agents could do to promote gender equality in Islamic societies. Attempts to promote gender equality are found to be systematically ineffective or even counterproductive insofar as they're seen as disrespectful meddling. If this empirical finding were well established, it would have the upshot on Bites' political view 
that gender equality could not be a human right because its violation could never trigger effective international action because there is no effective international action one could take. Now, if you find that conclusion hard to swallow, I think it's because the political view offers the wrong characterization of what it is to be a human right. Women have a right not to be discriminated against because others, including the state they inhabit, bear obligations not to discriminate against them. It's a further question, an independent question, whether or not these obligations can be advanced by means of international action. Now, in defending the orthodox view, I think there's a broader lesson to be learned. And that is the importance of separating out human rights as moral ideals from any set of policies, mechanisms, or institutions for giving effect to them. It's one question what human rights essentially are, universal moral rights, if I'm right. It's another vitally important, but nonetheless different question, how we best give effect to them in any given point in history. We best preserve the integrity and critical power of human rights discourse by not conflating those two questions as the political view tends to do. I think this is especially so when it comes to the extremely contentious and problematic policy of foreign intervention. I don't think it's very friendly to human rights to tether that very concept to such a fraught policy as one of foreign intervention, in particular military intervention. So let me shift now to the question of the grounds of human rights. And let me introduce that question by quoting a story told by Jacques Maritain, a well-known Catholic philosopher from the middle of the last century. And the, this is the quotation. He says, it is related that at a UNESCO national commission where human rights were being discussed, someone expressed astonishment that certain champions of violently opposed ideologies had agreed on a list of those rights. Remember, this is during the Cold War. Yes, they said, we agree about the rights, but on condition that no one asks us why. And Maritain goes on to say, that why, that why is where the argument begins. Now, the why question is the question of grounds. What makes it the case that something is a human right, a universal moral right? Now, if we agree on the human rights, you might reasonably ask whether we need to bother about the question why we do so. Now, this question was pressed very hard by the American pragmatist philosopher Richard Rorty. Giving justifications for human rights was perfectly appropriate back in the 18th century, Rorty said, when they seemed radical, unheard of proposals. But in our day, according to Rorty, Human rights command far more agreement than anything we might use to justify them. Therefore, trying to justify them is a pointless and potentially counterproductive exercise. Now, there are many things wrong with Rorty's view. Let me just mention one of them. Rorty says we agree on the human rights. And it's true, many of us would come up with an almost identical list of human rights, rights with the same names or labels, such as a right not to be tortured, or privacy, or free speech. But whether the lists are truly identical depends not on the names, but on the content of the rights, on what it is exactly that they entitle us to, what the duties are that are associated with them. And it's very doubtful that we do agree on the content of human rights. A recent vivid example of disagreement about content was the Bush administration's rather creative reinterpretation of the paradigmatic human right, the right not to be tortured. You may recall this was defined by lawyers for the Bush administration as damage to, that rises to the level of death, organ failure, or the permanent impairment of a significant body function. But we also see disagreements between American and European approaches to free speech on matters such as Holocaust denial or pornography. So Maritain was dead wrong to say that disagreement only begins with the why question. Moreover, disagreements as to content that I've been highlighting can only be addressed by asking the why question, because it's only if we know what makes something a human right that we can begin to specify its content. <clears throat> 
So the why question can't be sidelined on the basis that we all agree on what the rights are. So what are the grounds or the foundations of human rights? Now, in answering this question, um, the answer I give to this question in the book appeals to two intimately related grounds. Often in philosophy, people try to single out one particular ground. I think this is a hopeless endeavor. Both of these grounds have their partisans, but I think they actually have to work together to make any sense. The first ground of human rights is what I call universal human interests. Interests are the elements of a good life, the fulfillment of which makes a person's life better than otherwise it would be. Now, I don't elaborate a theory of universal human interests in my book. I mean, there's only so much of a fool's errand I'm willing to undertake. But uh, I draw on work that's been done in this area by some of my former colleagues at Oxford, especially John Finnis and James Griffin. And they make it clear, and at least they make it clear to me, that there is an irreducible plurality of human interests. Human well-being does not boil down to one overarching interest, such as pleasure or the avoidance of pain. There is an open-ended list of universal interests, such as knowledge, accomplishment, friendship, play, and so on. And the other point is that the interests are objective, the point that a lot of people find very difficult to swallow. The interests are objective. They are interests of ours, irrespective of whether we believe them to be our interests or whether we desire them. So there is a rich, broadly Aristotelian account of the human good at the basis of human rights. Now, even if there's a plurality of interests, some philosophers, and most prominent among them James Griffin and Amartya Sen, have argued that human rights are ultimately derived from one kind of interest, our interest in freedom, our interest in being able to choose from a valuable array of options and to pursue our choices without interference from others. So on this view, human rights are ultimately protections of freedom, which is one human good amongst others. It's wrong to say that all human goods play into the existence of human rights. Now, although it would be elegant to conclude that all human rights serve one fundamental interest, I think this view comes at an excessive cost. There are three things I would highlight. If human rights are protections of freedom, humans without the capacity for choice will lack human rights. Second, it just seems very odd, even when we're talking about fully competent adults, that human rights only protect freedom. You see this oddness in Griffin's discussion of torture, where he says, torture violates a human right because it undermines our capacity to reach a decision and stick to it. As if the fact that torture is bloody painful is irrelevant to it being a human right violation. As if the fact that torture grossly corrodes our capacity for friendship and attachment with others and undermines our trust in others is irrelevant to it being a human rights violation. The final thing I would say is this. In a world in which human rights morality is constantly subject to the objection that it's another form of Western imperialism, reflecting Western bias in favor of freedom as opposed to all other goods, I think we don't put ourselves in a good position to counteract that objection by saying that it's the only good that's relevant to the justification of human rights. But I think that interests aren't enough. And the other ground that I appeal to in the book is the idea of equal human dignity. So it's interests and dignity working together to justify human rights. The interests are the interests of human beings who have an inherent value simply in virtue of their status as human beings. We possess this value because we belong to a species with a nature of a certain kind, most centrally a rational nature. We all possess this value and to an equal degree. This is so even if in the case of some individual humans, this nature cannot be fully actualized because they're suffering, for example, from senile dementia or some other such condition. So the second foundation is the inherent value of being a human, equal human dignity. Now, I say the two grounds, interest and dignity, work together in intimate alliance. If you didn't have dignity, you'd be much more liable to the utilitarian thought that individuals are simply the location at which interests are realized. There'd be little to stop you saying that you should maximize the fulfillment of interests by trading off some people's interests against others. There'd be little to stop you saying that you should torture one innocent person to prevent five other innocent persons from being tortured. So though I accept the idea of dignity is a rather difficult, intractable, and nebulous concept, I think it's essential to appeal to it because by emphasizing the 
irreducible value of the individual, you precisely erect some kind of barrier or resistance to the idea that you simply are engaged in a process of maximizing interests across all people. People count intrinsically, and that's what the idea of human dignity is bringing out. So human rights have a double foundation in dignity and rights, but they're not the, and interests, but they're not the same as dignity and interests. Actions or attitudes that contravene interests or dignity are not necessarily human rights violations. And the reason for this was given earlier, because human rights violations involve duties. And it's not always the case that actions inconsistent with others' dignity and interests are violations of duties. So let me give two examples. You beat someone fair and square for a job that they covered, the only job in philosophy going this year. <laughs> you may have impaired their interests. Arguably, you may have ruined their life. But it doesn't follow that you've done anything wrong that you have violated a duty owed to them. The same analysis applies to someone in dire need of a kidney transplant. You'd be acting with admirable charity if you donated your spare healthy kidney, but the failure to do so is not a violation of the duty owed to them. The other doesn't have a human right to your spare kidney. That's an example from interests, but I think we can equally come up with an example from the side of dignity, how disrespecting dignity is not necessarily a human rights violation. Imagine someone I'll call a liberal racist. He has impeccably liberal beliefs, sincerely held, yet because of a conservative upbringing, he might find himself saddled with emotional responses that are racist, responses that are rooted in the idea that, say, blacks do not possess fully equal status with whites. He may even experience these emotional responses with dismay, as when he's disappointed to find that the new family moving next door is black and is dismayed at his disappointment. But it's doubtful that such a response in and of itself constitutes a human rights violation, although it's morally reprehensible. So in all these cases, there may be a setback to interests or a failure to properly re register equal human dignity. But arguably, at least, there is no rights violation. And the reason for this is that no duty was clearly contravened in those cases, at least not one owed to someone as a matter of right. Now, thinking about why there was no duty leads us to one of the most difficult questions in the philosophy of human rights, and that is how we get from the underlying values, which I'm suggesting are interests and dignity, to the conclusion that they generate a duty to respect them or protect them in various ways. Uh, this is a very complex question, but I think I'll just note two considerations that are relevant that are called possibility and burdensomeness, two considerations relevant to going from interest and dignity to a duty. So the first consideration is possibility. There'll be no duty to do something if it's not possible to do that thing. The self-policing of immediate emotional responses is something that is not generally possible for us to achieve. Hence, the liberal racist's emotional responses are arguably not a violation of duty, although they are morally defective. Taking a more obvious example, there can be no human right to ensure that everyone is an above average student, because it's simply not logically possible for all students to be above average. Fans of Monty Python's Life of Brian will also remember the sophisticated discussion of a man's supposed right to bear children, also ruled out on grounds of impossibility, this time biological. So that's possibility. The other consideration, burdensomeness. Even if it were possible for people to subject their emotional responses to the necessary form of self-policing, it would be too burdensome to demand this as a matter of duty, just as it would be too burdensome to impose upon people the duty to furnish those in need of a transplant with their spare kidney. Although it would be morally praiseworthy for someone to denote th donate their healthy kidney, they would not be violating a right in failing to do so. And of course, there are very difficult questions here, which costs count? towards burdensomeness. So the fact that pharmaceutical companies charge like wounded bulls for drugs is not part of the costs we need to factor in, because that's a product of a choice they simply make. But other costs do factor in. So I think philosophers have been much exercised about finding the holy grail, the value protected by human rights. I think human rights protect an array of values. The much more difficult question is, how do we get from those values to something that has the shape of a duty? 
And that's something that we haven't written really enough about or grappled with sufficiently. Uh, for the obvious reason, I think that it's too hard. Third and final question, the question of force. What is the force of human rights? What's their role in practical deliberation? Especially, how should we conceive of conflicts involving human rights? Now, often a focus for the topic of force is the more specific question whether there are any absolute human rights. In other words, are there any human rights of such surpassing weight that it's never justifiable to violate them, irrespective of the cost? Now, in one way, this question is easily answered, depending on how you specify the right. For example, the right of people not to be tortured simply for fun is obviously an absolute one. But of course, it gets far more complicated if we don't introduce qualifications as to the motive for torture. Another way in which the issue of absolute rights is complex is the need to draw a distinction between human rights as a matter of morality versus human rights as they figure in law. Even if you conceded that the moral right not to be tortured could be overridden in very extreme cases, it's a further question whether the law should reflect this possibility. For example, if the law treated the right not to be tortured as non-absolute, this might have the unintended effect of actually encouraging torture in cases where it isn't justified. And that illustrates the broader theme that the road from the morality of human rights to the morality of the law of human rights is often a long and winding one without shortcuts. But I want to accept that many, if not all, human rights are subject to being defeated or overridden. The point I want to make is that there is a tendency to vastly exaggerate the extent to which human rights come into conflict and are subject to trade-offs, either among themselves or against other concerns, such as the common good. Even if they're not immune to trade-offs, human rights are highly resistant to them. And I want to conclude with some thoughts on why human rights are not as readily liable to be defeated as we are often led to believe they are by philosophers, lawyers, and others. So I'll just highlight one of these reasons, because I'm conscious of time. Human rights are not the same as the interests they derive from. That was a crucial point I tried to emphasize earlier. Instead, they enter into practical deliberation not as interests, but as duties deriving from interests and equal status of dignity. Once we see that human rights involve duties, then we're in a position to resist the idea that they are regularly subject to trade-offs, because it belongs to the idea of a duty that it's resistant to trade-offs, not absolutely, but generally. So let me give an example of one scenario that some philosophers would say involves a conflict of human rights. Griffin says this, for example. The case of a properly convicted murderer who has been given a just sentence of imprisonment. The just sentence is demanded by the fact that he violated his victim's right to life. Now, the philosophers I have in mind would say that in, in imposing the just sentence, we are justifiably violating the murderer's right to liberty. So the claim is we have two things in the balance. On the one hand, the just sentence, which reflects the right to, right to life of the victim, and on the other hand, the right to liberty of the murderer. And the claim is that the right to life of the victim, as reflected in the just sentence, outweighs the right to liberty of the murderer and justifies violating their right to liberty. I think this way of looking at the situation is profoundly mistaken. The murderer's right to liberty is not violated, not even justifiably violated, by the sentence of imprisonment. What is impaired by the sentence is the murderer's interest in liberty. That's the point of punishment. It's supposed to inflict hard treatment on wrongdoers. But the interest in liberty is not the same as the right to liberty. The right to liberty is determined by the extent to which the interest generates a duty. And I think there is simply no duty to allow a murderer to remain at large when a just sentence requires that he be imprisoned. Or put it another way, the just sentence does not defeat the murderer's right to liberty. Instead, the right to liberty is subject to exceptions, one of which is the demands of just punishment. So a situation where someone's right to liberty was really overridden 
would be something like a case of justified internment. This is a situation where the state imprisons without trial a large group of people, many of whom the state knows in advance are bound to be innocent, though it can't identify which, in order to avoid some massive threat like the bombing of a major city. Here, their right to liberty really is justifiably overridden. And this is manifest in various ways. For example, an innocent member of this group, unlike the properly convicted murderer, would be justified in taking steps to avoid internment. Moreover, unlike the properly convicted murderer, innocent people subject to imprisonment in these situations would be owed an apology and perhaps even compensation after the event. These are markers of the obligation that was overridden, even though justifiably so. And I think there are similar problems about the claims that human rights come into conflict with the common good or the general welfare, but I'll put them to, a, to, to one side now. Now, it seems to me, in concluding, that there is a serious danger in the picture of human rights as constantly in conflict and hence constantly in need of being traded off against each other or against other values. The danger is that we lose sight of the distinctive moral logic of human rights. The logic according to which they are not merely interests, however important, but sources of obligation. Obligation whose violation constitutes a moral <coughs> wrong, even if a justified moral wrong. Yet talk of conflicts of human rights and trade-offs is rife both in philosophy and in the wider culture. I would especially single out European human rights lawyers who are influenced by certain doctrines in German jurisprudence. They identify human rights violations wherever there's been a setback to a significant interest. But the failure to distinguish human rights from the interests they protect is also rife. A paradigm example is the United Nations General Comment 14 on the right to health, which seems to regard everything that furthers health as part of the right to health. Yet there are all sorts of things that further the interest in health that we do not have a right to because it's impossible to deliver them or because to do so is excessively burdensome. All this suggests a rather disheartening possibility that our widespread commitment to human rights may be largely ideological window dressing more a matter of the rhetoric of human rights than of attunement to its reality. It's a possibility we should take seriously. So here, I think, is something helpful that philosophy can do. It can constantly remind us of the distinctive significance of human rights. Human rights are not just a shopping list of everything that is beneficial to humans. Lack of rigor about this may in the short term be an effective rhetorical ploy when competing with scarce resources. For example, if you want the resources to go to health, it helps to say there's a human right to them. But in the longer term, lack of rigor threatens to undermine the discourse of human rights. And that discourse is something we urgently need to defend. We need to defend it in the face of emerging powerful new states that do not have a tradition of respect for human rights. We need to defend it against the new competitor to human rights, the bare insistence on the rule of law, the stripped down ethic of the foreign investor, Above all, we need to defend human rights from their so-called friends. One of the earliest conversations I had at Harvard about my project, someone asked me what I was working on. I said human rights. They responded, how very depressing for you. I hope, <laughs> I hope this lecture wasn't depressing. I actually think of it as really a message of hope. Thank you very much. introduces the issue of a hierarchy of rights, but it also introduces the issue of trade-off. You derogate in times of emergency, as it were, and, and presumably one of the, the things that certainly bothers my students much is, what are human rights worth if you derogate them? You trade one set of rights against a, a national security emergency or whatever. I'm just wondering how you think philosophically about derogation as an issue. 
Okay, so I find derogation really quite intractable. It's ambiguous between at least two notions. So one thing you might mean when you say that a human right is non-derogable is that um, you can't contract out of it, that you're bound by it willy-nilly. Okay, so this is one idea that some human rights are use kogans. You're bound by them irrespective of whether you've agreed to them and you can't contract out of them. Another notion of non-derogability is this idea that nothing would ever justify not complying with that right. So I take it that you're saying it's the second notion of derogability that you're talking about. Um, my own view about it is that something I hinted at earlier, um, that there's a difference between how we deal with this in law with, from how we deal with this in morality. I have, I'm ashamed to say I do convince myself that there are situations where I could imagine as a moral thought experiment that there could be um, a, just, a sufficient case for torturing someone in order to bring about a certain result, say, save the life of a child by twisting the arm of the person who knows where the child is and will die at any moment unless you inflict this form of torture on them. So it seems to me that you can conjure up scenarios where morally it's the case that um, you would be justified in violating, you'd still be violating the right and doing a wrong, but that violation would be justified. But I think there's a separate question, an entirely separate question, about whether we should have a policy of torture that is legally accepted, and whether we should train people to be torturers and have this as an official policy of the state. I think there are powerful reasons for saying that the answer to that must be no. So the same morality that in the kind of pure case says torture would be justified, says in response to the institutional question, there is a tr tremendous case for treating it as a non-derogable right. <coughs> and then you have the other question, well, what happens when someone actually does commit torture in cases that you think are morally justified, but now they're acting in a way that the law says are not permissible? And I think the best way to handle this is, I think people like the late Thomas Frank suggested, was at the level of sentencing. But not at the level of preemptively saying we're going to identify situations where. Now there may be other situations where that doesn't work, but I'm thinking specifically here of the, the, the case of torture. But what it just and what follows from that, as I hear you, is the creation of legal structures of derogation is actually a bad idea. I think it's a separate idea. I think so when philosophers do this thought experiment thing and create a situation for you where look suddenly there seems to be a compelling case for violating this norm. They too quickly go to an institutional conclusion. I mean, this systematically happens in philosophy. And the point is, no, politics, law, has its own logic outside of the logic of what I should do as an individual in this, these particular circumstances. Um, so therefore, merely answering that question in that way in that individual case doesn't begin to address the question how you should fashion institutions to respect human rights. Yes, Carol. Thank you for this wonderful presentation, John. Um, your description of human rights as arising from interests and dignity made me wonder whether that doesn't create the possibility of some of the conflicts that you want to suppress um, in the third part of your discussion. Because interests, we might think of many of them as individual um, interests, but dignity definitely has a collective aspect to it. So we might say, for example, that prostitution violates the dignity of women, but there might be individual women who want to assert their autonomous right to make a living as sex workers, um, uh, and that might, so their 
inherent conflict with dignitary, group dignitary ideas? That's a really great question. Um, I'd really hate it if they were inherent conflict. I think they might contingently come up in conflict in some cases. The one thing I would say is I think there'd be a real issue of conflict if interests were subjectively given. So if my interests were simply given by my preferences, um, and that is how a lot of people under the spell of economists think of interests, right? They think that you're fulfilling your interests if you're fulfilling your preferences, or if they're a bit more sophisticated, your informed preferences, right? Um, one of the hardcore aspects of my work is I don't accept that view of um, well-being or of interests. I have an objectivist view of well-being. So I think that um, autonomy isn't simply doing what you desire or doing what you have a preference for. I think autonomy is about choosing from a range of valuable options, objectively valuable, not simply valuable according to you. So the way I would begin to respond to that question, the dwarf tossing one, is to go back to the case of um, slavery. And someone says, I want to be a slave. I'm going to be paid a lot of money to enter into this contract of slavery. I choose to be a slave. The money will help my family, etc. Um, so I want the law to uphold and recognize this contract of slavery that I'm entering into. And I presumably we would say that we're not going to do that because the proper understanding of the autonomy we want to protect is one already influenced by dignity. And it's not a genuine form of autonomous choice if you decide to do something that in that way undermines, one, your um, dignity, and second, also undermines some other form, aspects of your autonomy. So I think what you're suggesting is probably correct, that there might come a point where I'd be faced with some contingent conflict between these two elements. But I'd like to forestall it as much as I can by emphasizing the objectivist character of the notion of autonomy. I recognize, though, that this will make my view profoundly unappealing to many people because they think that autonomy simply is doing what you desire. So when someone desires to um, rape a small child and we interfere with that, we're, in a sense, setting back their interests. Or as I would say, no interest of his is set back when we prevent him from doing this thing that has zero value, in fact, has massive negative value. Yes? Uh, from your orthodox point of view, is it only the human species that has uh, intrinsic uh, value, rights, and dignity? Uh, should we take a view towards other species that's uh, almost strictly instrumentalist in its character and its relation to uh, the human species? Why do we privilege the human species over all other species? That seems rather arbitrary. I can understand that in the uh, 18th century, but I'm not so sure that that is uh, entirely valid uh, currently. No, that's a good question. I should have put in a disclaimer. I really don't want to do that. Um, so I think that um, animals have interests. I think animals have dignity. There's the inherent dignity of being a crocodile, according to the Israeli Supreme Court. This is not funny to me. I think it makes absolute sense. And I think in virtue of that, that it makes sense also to say that animals have rights. I just wasn't talking about them. But it's a mistake on my part that I didn't emphasize that because I, I don't want to say that um, human dignity and human interests are essential for having rights. I just want to say they're essential to human rights, but they're also animal rights. Another topic, making me feel I'm not as foolish as I was. I could have discussed that in the book as well, but I should actually have a disclaimer about it because I think it does convey that impression. Catherine. So, Catherine. Um, following up on your interesting notion about the grounds of human rights and possibility and burdens of those, and I'm wondering whether that's a, obviously those are two factors that will change over time, yep. and especially in an area like health. If you think of the right to health, you can think that both what is possible and what is burdensome uh, has changed in relatively short time. If you look at what happened with uh, the debates over HIV uh, drugs in Africa, for example, one might have argued at one point that it was not, neither possible, either not possible or too burdensome to make drugs available to uh, HIV individuals in Africa. Now it has become both possible and less burdensome. Um, or the Supreme Court decision about uh, 
about the right to health from kidney, uh, the South African Supreme Court decision on the right to, act, to health around uh, uh, kidney dialysis. They simply, essentially, they took your argument. They said it's it's simply too burdensome to this uh, health service in South Africa that is, has such limited resources to be able to provide dialysis to someone who is essentially not a candidate for a transplant. Um, so I'm wondering whether you see this as tools for uh, evolution of, uh, of human rights. I really appreciate the question. I had a prompt to myself to talk about this, and I ignored it, so I'm really glad that you raised it. Some people think that human rights are immutable rights possessed throughout human history by all human beings, right? And that could be an interesting topic. If you're interested in cavemen, you might wonder, you know, what rights did they have? But as I said, I'm interested in the practice of human rights, in particular, the kind of idea that was behind the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. I don't think that was about trying to figure out immutable human rights that have been possessed throughout human history. So I think it makes perfect sense to say human rights evolve, the rights that we have can evolve over time, and they evolve in, 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 as a matter of changes in what's possible and what's regarded as excessively burdensome. Technology can make not burdensome something that formerly was burdensome. Then suddenly we have a right to this thing, the internet, that previously we didn't have a right to. So I think this is actually a strength of the view and it matches the way in which human rights evolve. So it's not like, oh, well, they had mistaken views in the past, and therefore now we have correct views. It could partly be that they had mistaken views. It could partly be that circumstances objectively change the facts about human rights. And I think this is a particularly important way of addressing some of the skepticism that people have about socioeconomic rights. They say, well, these are just newfangled rights. They're not real rights. You know, in the old days, no one ever talked about um, right to work, and it's a positive right to work, that someone should be given work opportunities or a right to an adequate standard of living. But if you look at that context, there was a lot of um, sort of political, political economic assumptions that it was simply not possible to arrange society in such a way that there was not going to be no significantly poor section of society. People just didn't think that was possible. You know, the poor are always with us. It was not just a religious notion, it was an economic notion. They believed that. And it, it may, for all we know, be true. Right? But part of what happens over time is things that were formerly not possible become possible. But equally, it might be that through climate change and so forth, we maybe eventually end up losing some of the rights we possess now because the circumstances actually can deteriorate as well as improve. Just right at the back. Matthias, yes. Yeah, I'm wondering how your account deals with the even standing objections to uh, you know, the orthodox theory. And here's the, the two. Uh, the first is uh, that's the line that you know, Adam Buchanan has been pushing quite substantially <coughs> is to say, look, one very central component of international human rights law coming from the Universal Declaration is a status egalitarian component. Right? This is a strong emphasis uh, in there. Uh, and it's just very hard to see how you would get that out of an orthodox theory if you start with objective interest and with dignity to get from there to not just, not just any kind of relational notions, but really status equality of the sort spelled out in Articles 1 and 2 of the Universal Declaration. Now, you can fold a lot of stuff into notions of interest and dignity, but the closer you want to actually stay to the idea of what's derived from us being human, simply in virtue of humanity, the closer you stay to that, the less plausible it becomes to get any kind of comparative stuff out of that certainly egalitarian connection. So first question, how does your account handle that? And the second one is, um, I find it actually quite striking um, that you uh, emphasized so strongly, or maybe to say conceded so clearly, that the task of seeing how we how we get from interest and dignity to duties is just too hard. Because if you uh, if you are not, I was just being modest. Well, but, but, you know, you've been at this for a long time. So this, 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 this is a core task, right? So if you say uh, I'm sticking to the orthodox theory. Uh, you know, what, what you're doing then is you, you make the idea of what's coming out of shared humanity central, and then you need to show how you get from there to duties, and you do this constantly, you appeal to this, to the doability of this constantly, but then, well, it doesn't lead us there, it leads us here, right? So, so you presuppose in, your, in what you call the logic of human rights constantly that we can do this, that we yeah. can derive one way or another duties from, from, uh, from interest and dignity. But then you're also saying we really don't have a, a general way of explaining how to do it. Right. And so then I would say, look, I mean, I'm not even a sternest critic of this. I would say this at least implies that the orthodox theory, you know, the way I do it, needs to be supplemented with a lot of with other components.
but I, now let me just play the harsh critic. I'd say, isn't that a declaration of bankruptcy? If after all these years of thinking about that, you still have to say we have no way of doing this. Well, the, so on the point, the second point, the question is, what's the alternative? Is there a better account of how we generate these duties? But the other thing I would really want to stress is this, um, and I didn't stress this in the talk, there's only so much that pure moral reasoning can do. And it's a mistake to ask it to do more. Right? Big lesson from Aristotle. Um, can pure moral reasoning tell me exactly how much the murderer should receive as a just punishment? I think it can't. Does that mean that it's subjective? No. It can tell me that merely writing him a letter of strong complaint is not a sufficient punishment. But it could also tell me that you know, having him torn limb from limb by dogs, wild dogs, is an excessive punishment. There is a range. And then within that range, some reasonable range, we need some process of social decision to pick out what that's going to be. So in a way, I made it appear harder for myself because I was purely talking about what the situation is from the perspective of pure moral reasoning. But that's never the situation. Pure moral reasoning always has to be supplemented by social decision, whether it's conventions, whether it's uh, law, that take up the slack. And what I would say is, this is not unique to human rights. This is across the board in ethics. That's why you need lawyers as well as philosophers. Right? It's not, and I really resist the, um, often this ambition of, of philosophers to come up with these highly precise moral norms I just think they're intruding into the area of social decision. They're intruding into the area that law has to play a role. So I think there is something to be said. It doesn't get you all the way, but that's typically the case in moral reasoning. You often need this extra element to make more concrete. You know it has to be more concrete. There's a moral reason to make it more concrete, but pure morality won't tell you what that more concrete outcome will be. You need some social decision. Well, I think I, I wouldn't know how to begin deriving any duties unless I appeal to interests and unless I appeal to some kind of status that people have. What would I appeal to? But let me address the other point about Buchanan. Um, and let me just take a wider angle view rather than talk about the specific thing you talked about. Buchanan has written a book which is very interesting. It says that international lawyers and others have often said, well, human rights are rights we possess simply in virtue of our humanity. It's something like the orthodox view. And his claim is, any adequate account of human rights surely has to account for human rights law, and that there's no way in which we can see human rights law as simply reflecting background moral rights, because these background moral rights won't give us anything like what international human rights law gives us. Mm. Um, I'd say that there are two problems with that. The first is he's got a really mistaken view about how we generate rights. Um, and the mistaken view is he thinks that there is a contrast between individual rights and the common good. So if something's an aspect of the common good, it can't be something you have a right to. But the whole tradition of Aquinas and more recently Finnis, Raz, doesn't buy into that disjunction between something I've got a right to and something that's part of the common good. So therefore things like mm. immunization for diphtheria and so forth could be things we have rights to, even though um, they're also part of the common good. But the second thing is this. Always in philosophy, you have to ask the question, what's the alternative to the position that I'm putting forward? Because every position has got its pros and cons. So he says, what international human rights law is doing is not securing pre-existing moral rights. It's securing two other things, a decent minimum for all people, a decent level of satisfaction of their interests, and some basic notion of status equality. Now, here's the problem. What is a decent minimum? How do I specify when something is at the decent minimum or above the decent minimum? I think the only answer is something like, at what point is a duty generated to all human beings to provide them with this minimum? So therefore, his alternative is not a replacement of the orthodox view. It just is a different way of specifying the orthodox view. And equally, if I'm right, if I was right about the point that I could disrespect, so I could have racist sentiments that are not rights violations, right? then the mere fact that I'm appealing to status equality doesn't yet get me to human rights. 
I have to talk about a certain way of violating that status equality, which is violating some kind of duty arising from that status. He's got the same problem that I have, but he's pretending he doesn't have the problem by talking about notions like decent minimum and status equality, whereas in fact we want to know what levels of these, what aspects of these are protected by human rights law, not all of them. So I think it's not, it's, it's not a genuine alternative to the view that I'm putting forward. Please join me in thanking.